Good evening, and thank you for the introduction, Janet. I'd also like to thank the Arne Pryor and District Historical Society for the invitation to join you this evening. I'm joining you tonight from Ottawa on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. While the presentation I'm about to make will be in English, I'll be happy to receive and answer questions and points for discussion in French as well. William James Rui, or Bill to his friends and many others who knew him, is arguably Canada's best-known naval architect. His iconic schooner Blue Nose, launched in 1921, became and remains a famous symbol in Canada and abroad. During the 1920s and 1930s, Blue Nose came to represent not only Nova Scotia, but Canada as well. The races for the International Fisherman's Trophy, pitting Canadian schooners from Lunenburg against their American counterparts from Gloucester, captured national attention in the same way hockey playoffs do today. The story of the original Blue Nose and her skipper, Angus Walters, competing in the International Fisherman's Trophy races, entered national lore and has been the subject of numerous books as well as a Heritage Minute. A successor, Blue Nose II, launched in 1963, once again became a symbol of Nova Scotia and Canada. The schooner's likeness has been reproduced in many ways, on stamps and coins, on Nova Scotia license plates, in photographs, in books, in song, and in innumerable souvenirs. Although Bill Rui and his career as a naval architect encompassed much more than Blue Nose, it was the success of this early design that established his reputation as a naval architect and helped him reach new clients elsewhere in Canada and, importantly, in the United States. My part of tonight's talk, drawing on the William James Rui collection at the Canadian Museum of History and on other sources, will cover his early life and the initial development of his career, as well as touching on some of the consequences of the dramatic success of Blue Nose, his 17th design. My colleague Amanda Gould will be talking about the material characteristics of the plan set that tell us more about Rui's design process and his professional practices. Bill Rui came from an entrepreneurial family, which by the time of his birth had established itself in the soda water and soft drink trade in Halifax. One of the consequences of this entrepreneurialism is that William was almost not born in Halifax at all. His father, James Rui, a soda water manufacturer, had moved to St. John, New Brunswick in the late 1860s. Initially working in the soda water business with Thomas Nash, James later became a commission merchant on his own, for reasons that will likely remain unclear at this distance in time. In St. John, James met Grace Penaligon, a teacher and daughter of a local house builder and carpenter. They were married in 1873, but later moved westwards, perhaps in search of other opportunities. Their eldest son, John Frederick Lemin Rui, was born in Lennoxville, Quebec, in February 1877. James, and possibly his younger brother Frederick, were in partnership with a local brewer, and in the months that followed, they seemed to have sought to expand into the larger Montreal market. Beginning in 1877, they entered into a series of business arrangements with Montreal soda water manufacturer Vital Cousineau. The latter's bankruptcy in 1878, however, appears to have led to the Rui brothers returning to Halifax, where William was born on 27th April, 1879. One of the challenges in writing about the early life of Bill Rui, or even writing about his pre-1920 life, is the limited number of sources available. Other than A Spirit Deep Within, the biography written by Bill's great-granddaughter Joan Rui, much of what is available is derived from information solicited by Andrew Merkel at the time he was writing Schooner Blue Nose. This was just after the Second World War, by which time some of Rui's childhood friends had died. There is also Phyllis Blakely's 1961 article in Atlantic Advocate, which drew on interviews with Rui himself and conversations and correspondence with Rui's longtime friend, client, and supporter, Ernest Bell. At this stage of research, much is derived from published records and secondary sources, while more thorough archival research is being undertaken, although that has unfortunately been disrupted by the ongoing pandemic. Bill Rui grew up in Halifax, in its south end, seen circled here in orange, and close to its bustling harbour. 
In the first years of Bill's life, the family lived at 2 Fawson Street, located at the south end of Lower Water Street, opposite the Royal Engineer's Yard. More about the yard in a minute. The street no longer exists, and the approximate location of the house is in a parking lot opposite the Discovery Center. The Rui family soon moved to 18 Mitchell Street, also not far from the harbor. As has been noted by others, this was also just across the street from a lumber yard owned by prominent builder S.M. Brookfield. Also worth noting, especially given Bill's later proclivity for using cast iron ballast, or boiler punchings in concrete, is the proximity of the Chibucto foundry and machine works. Within a few years, the family moved to a grander property at nearby 14 Kent Street, a short walk away, but also close to the harbor. It was also close to the Royal Engineer's Yard and Wharf. From a young age, Bill Rui was fascinated with boats, building models to test his designs, at first in local ponds, but later in the harbor itself. It is interesting to speculate on whether the lumber yard on Mitchell Street helped spark or facilitate a lifelong interest in wooden boats, along with Freshwater Brook running nearby, Steele's Pond at Point Pleasant Park, and Egg Pond on the North Commons, where Haligonians raced model yachts at least into the 1920s. The proximity of the Royal Engineer's Wharf certainly encouraged Bill's interests. According to one account, a young Bill Rui gained access to the wharf to see Galatia, the unsuccessful British challenger for the America's Cup, racing during its visit to Halifax in 1887. Rui also devoured books about yacht design, notably Dixon Kemp's two-volume Yacht Architecture. The first copy he received was from F. H. Bell. More about that connection shortly. The book is worth a look and is available online, but I do not recommend reading it for its plot or its character development. The language used here will seem familiar to those who know Rui's description of Blue Nose, his statement that he gave her the power to carry sail. Schoolmate Fred Lessel, seen here with the Dal Medical Students football team in 1902, later noted that Bill would have done better in school, including the Halifax Academy, had he not been spending his time sketching and designing boats. Leaving school at 17, described by some as the outcome of a dispute with the teacher over nautical nomenclature, and by others as a lack of focus on schoolwork due to his growing nautical interests, Bill worked as a clerk for the wholesale grocery firm of Bald and Gibson before joining the family soft drink firm around 1903 or 1904. He also took night classes in mechanical drafting at the Victoria School of Art and Design, now NASCAD University, giving him the drafting skills he would need to become a naval architect. As an inquisitive and enthusiastic lover of boats and their design, Rui had long been drawn to the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron, at that time located not far from the family's home. It was to be a lifelong connection. He frequented its boatyard and crewed on members' boats while he was still a teenager and not yet eligible for membership, and also studied in the clubhouse's library. One of Bill's earliest actions after starting his first job was to become a junior member of the squadron in June of 1897, at a cost of $10, while another was to purchase a new copy of Dixon Kemp to replace the one he had worn out while it was being loaned to him, at a cost of $16. Together, these represented one quarter of his $100 yearly salary. I mentioned before that one of the challenges in dealing with Bill Rui's early life is the scarcity of sources. This challenge includes the fact that by the time Andrew Merkel started gathering information for his book about Blue Nose in 1946, Fred Lessel had died, which means that his accounts were transmitted to Merkel at second hand. This may have had the effect of obscuring some details and in individuals, including Fred's older brother Raymond, who had died in 1913. The Lessels and the Ruiz had both lived on James Street, and while Fred was a couple of years younger than Bill Ruiz, Raymond had been born just a few weeks before, in March 1879. It's therefore possible that Raymond may have been the origin of some of the accounts about Bill's school days, since the two would have been more likely to have shared a classroom, and even perhaps a desk, than Bill and Fred would have, although Fred did attend the Halifax Academy as well. Something of even greater importance was Raymond's profession, architect, 
seen here in the 1901 census. He trained in Halifax and then in Toronto before returning to Halifax in 1903 to establish his own practice. Both Raymond and Bill were members of the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron. Raymond had joined in 1899, a couple of years after Bill, and shortly after moving back to Halifax in 1903, was commissioned to design a major addition to the squadron's clubhouse, with a further addition for its boat shop in 1906. The two worked in close association at the squadron. In 1907, for instance, they were its measurers, and it's worth noting that Bill was also on the sailing committee, although someone's managed to transpose his initials. Finally, and most importantly, Raymond was also an amateur naval architect, designing at least one yacht, the Kite II, launched in 1909. At this distance in time, we may never know how much influence Raymond had on Bill, and vice versa, but Amanda will be talking more about how architectural conventions and drafting practices that Bill may have acquired from Raymond, as well as from his classes, appear in the initial drawings for Blue Nose. Bill Ruey's job with Bald and Gibson, followed by the move to the family firm, helped establish him as an upwardly mobile young professional in the growing city of Halifax. Bill and his older brother John both joined the local militia, obtaining commissions with the artillery, and here on the left we see Bill's certificate of military instruction. As has often been noted, in pre-First World War Canada, the militia served a social as much as a military function. But at the turn of the century, John had also served twice in South Africa, and we see him here seated in the center in the photograph on the right, although Bill does not appear to have done so. Bill continued to experiment with model boats and moved further afield into designing full-size craft as well. The first full-size boat, built entirely to his own design, may have been for John, who also joined the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron in 1906, and who was recorded as owning the 22-foot motor launch Sturgeon. Phyllis Blakely's 1961 article about Bill Rui mentions that he had built a motorboat at the family factory, although it unfortunately does not give an exact date. In any event, by late 1907, Bill certainly felt comfortable enough with his talents to enter one of the many design competitions in The Rudder magazine. The design was to be for a, quote, 50-foot ocean racer to be capable of voyaging to Europe, carrying stores and water for eight men for 50 days, any rig, unquote. The results were announced in 1908, with Rui receiving a special mention for his yawl-rigged entry, although his name was misspelled as Rove. While there is no evidence that it was ever built, the published plans make it the earliest documentation of Rui's designs known to survive. That same year, on 24 June 1908, Bill married Winifred Conrad. An accomplished teacher at the Halifax School for the Deaf, she is seen here with Mary Jane Vano, one of her star pupils. According to at least one later commentator, Winifred helped teach Bill some of the advanced mathematics necessary for his more complex designs. The newlyweds spent around one year living in Halifax on Morris Street, seen here on the right, before moving to Dartmouth, which would be their home, with the exception of an interlude in New York for Bill, for the remainder of their lives. In addition to providing a venue for learning and sailing, the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron also provided Bill Rui with important connections and friendships. His first design to be built for a client was Babette, following shortly after the design competition in the rudder. Commissioned by squadron rear commodore Frank H. Bell, who along with his various relatives had long encouraged Rui's interests, the boat, designed in 1908, enjoyed a lengthy and successful career after its launching in 1909. Frank's relative Ernest, seen here on the left with Bill Rui in the middle, possibly aboard the Rui-designed bird-class yacht Blue Heron, would become a lifelong friend, patron, and repeat client. In the years that followed, Bill Rui would obtain other commissions, including Rowdy, seen here, which was built in 1910 for E.F. Zwicker. Another would be the yacht Zetes, designed and built between 1910 and 1911 for R.A. Corbett. Bill Rui, however, would remain a part-time naval architect, albeit one who spent more and more time at the task until he and his brother sold the family firm around 1929. 
it's not entirely clear what Bill Rui did during the First World War. Neither he nor his brother John show up in Canadian Expeditionary Force attestation papers, although both had military experience and were arguably of age to serve. John was, however, involved in patriotic charity work in Halifax, and Bill was involved in naval recruiting efforts. In March 1916, a fire destroyed the wooden building holding the bottling plant for the family soft drink company, with the incident being attributed to faulty wiring. The business relocated to a site at Pickford and Black's Wharf, which is now part of the historic properties and which stands to this day. The family home on Kent Street and the new location for its manufacturing plant seem to have escaped the major effects of the Halifax explosion the following December. There were no claims for damage for the address on Kent Street, and there don't seem to be any for the family soft drink company. Although John's son, also named John, and as people may have noticed by now, the family had a habit of repeating names, was injured in the blast. It was in the aftermath of the First World War that Bill Rui was commissioned to design Blue Nose. The competition for the International Fisherman's Trophy pitted working fishing schooners from Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, against their counterparts from Gloucester, Massachusetts. The initial race in 1920 was won handily by the American Esperanto, defeating the Canadian Delawana. Bill Rui had been part of the committee for the 1920 race, but would find himself even more involved in events soon afterwards. The committee formed to find a challenger to bring the International Fisherman's Trophy to Nova Scotia in the aftermath of the 1920 race, included three of Bill's friends and clients, F.H. Bell, for whom he had designed Babette, Reg Corbett, for whom he had designed Zetes, and E.F. Zwicker, for whom he had designed Rowdy, so it was perhaps not surprising that they chose him to design a champion for Nova Scotia. Some 40 years later, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation would interview both Bill Rui and Blue Nose Captain Angus Walters for a television show about the schooner. Rui recollected that it was likely Reg Corbett who had approached him on behalf of the committee, and according to Walters, quote, Rui was the only architect, I guess, that they'd known of around Halifax, unquote. At the committee's request, Bill Rui went to work designing a schooner to meet the requirements of the International Fisherman's Trophy. As the oft-repeated story goes, his initial design was for a ship with a waterline length of some 120 feet. Upon presenting it to the committee, he was informed that changes to the rules for qualifying vessels meant that the waterline length would need to be cut down to 112 feet, which required a complete redesign. These differences in waterline lengths are one of the factors that helped us distinguish between the two preliminary drawings that Amanda will be talking about tonight, and also to draw some conclusions about them, namely that one is the preliminary design and the other is the second draft that formed the basis for Rui's subsequent work. Using a scale of one eighth inch to the foot, which was used in the final drawings, gives a waterline length of around 120 feet for one preliminary drawing for the design and about 112 feet for the other. But more about that later. It's also worth noting this redesign was not simply a matter of a minor scaling down, but entailed revision and recalculation. As Bill Rui would later explain, he drew upon theoretical understandings of hull design, notably the waveform theory, to shape the ship's hull and decide on the distribution of its displacement to minimize resistance and maximize speed. The resulting Blue Nose, built by Smith and Ruland in Lunenburg, won the trophy in 1921, and the schooners continued racing successes and publicity trips throughout the 1920s and 30s made it Rui's best-known design. Here we see Rui on the right and Angus Walters on Blue Nose during the first of the two elimination trials races held to select a Canadian contender in October of 1921. To a large extent, Blue Nose has also overshadowed Rui's lengthy career and diverse output in the decades that followed. The famous schooner, however, also opened doors for Rui outside of Halifax, leading to commissions from Canadian and American clients alike. Rui needed to find such clients outside his immediate surroundings, where the pool of potential customers was relatively limited. He sought out, and in some cases successfully found, customers on the St. Lawrence and on the Great Lakes, but a much larger market lay to the south, in the United States, where Halifax and Nova Scotia's many small shipyards were connected with, by the Atlantic with other maritime cities, most notably New York. 
Soon after Blue Nose, Rui was designing yachts for American clients. This led to a long-running professional association and, for a period, partnership with Ford and Payne, a New York City firm of naval architects and yacht brokers. Their connection began in the early 1920s. From 1934 to 1936, Rui moved to City Island in New York City and became a partner in the firm. Its City Island offices were located in the house seen at lower right. In 1936, however, Bill Rui returned to Halifax, although he appears to have maintained an association with the firm until around 1940. Blue Nose also became a touchstone for Rui's career and reputation. In later designs, the Blue Nose Junior Schooners, as seen here, and the Blue Nose Class Sloops designed just after the Second World War, would also carry the same name. But those are histories for some other time. Thank you all for your attention, and at this point, I will turn things over to my colleague, Amanda. Good evening, all, and thank you, Jeff, for delivering the first part of our presentation. Before proceeding, I'd like to give a bit of an explanation about my position as conservator, paper and archival materials at the Canadian Museum of History. Within the larger collections division that includes the information management, collections management and conservation sections, I work within a team of conservators, each with a material specialty, such as furniture or textiles. As my title implies, I specialize in the conservation, which includes the preservation, conservation treatment, and sometimes restoration of documents and works of art on paper and related materials. To fulfill my role, I have to know about the properties of those materials, how they were made and for what they were used, by what mechanisms they break down over time, and how best to slow that degradation. And it's that expertise that I've brought to bear on materials in the William James Rui collection and part of what I'm going to share with you this evening. The Design 17 plan set housed in the Rui collection at the Canadian Museum of History contains a total of 10 plans. Five copies of the sail plan, four copies of the lines, and one keel profile. Five of the 10 plans are original drawings executed either on tracing cloth or in one instance on paper. The others are photo reproductions of those drawings produced as so-called lightning prints, silver gelatin contact prints that produced a negative image in white lines on a black background from which positive prints in either black lines on lightning paper or blueprints could be made. These blueprints and many other reprographic processes used for architectural drawings have alternate names and particular chemistries whose histories of use are interesting to explore, but they're not what we're going to talk about tonight. Tonight, we're going to take a step back in the process and examine the first plan in the set, drawn in graphite pencil on rather special paper, and explore what the material characteristics of that plan tell us about William Rui and his design for Blue Nose. Here we have an image of what we believe is Rui's first draft for Blue Nose. The sheet of paper as seen in this image had been humidified to unroll it safely and then dried slowly under uniform weight to convince the sheet to remain relatively flat. As is very typical of architectural plans, in Rui's lifetime, the majority of the collection appears to have been stored in rolls of multiple drawings and prints per plan set. And that's the format in which we received the collection at the museum. Now, I grant you that we can't see much in the way of a drawing in this image. Note that the graphite pencil markings are faint and obscured by an overall layer of smudged graphite and surface grime. We'll come back to these issues in a few moments. Now, when I told you when viewing the first slide that there are 10 plans in the set, some of you perhaps counted and saw that there were only nine items in the grouping that I photographed laid out on my work table in the museum. When I said 10, I wasn't lying to you, because in fact, the sheet bearing the first draft drawing is double-sided, and on the other side, we have what we believe to be the second draft. The second draft is, is the design that, based on its dimensions and assumed scale, is the one that was then redrawn or traced onto tracing cloth. That drawing was then used to make the multiple photo reproductions of the plan. You can perhaps see the lines in this image a little better because it's been partially worked up in black ink over the graphite um, here along the main mast and at the waterline. 
Other things to note on this side of the sheet are the multiple calculations made in the margins, uh, and then other features that one wouldn't be privy to in a finished presentation drawing, such as the multiple erasures over here, and this vertical band of darker smudging or grime with the, with the hard edge. The edge suggests that another drawing support was laid over top of this one and worked on. We can even speculate that the smudge marks are an indication of William Ruey's handedness. I'm told that he was right-handed, and I would believe that based on the arc, the arc of these smudges. Then lastly, notice the word blue nose inscribed here at the bottom. I grant you that it's probably still a little hard to see. So here on the left of your screen is a detail of the inscription of the name Blue Nose, located just above the waterline, past the bowsprit, represented in the drawing. This is assumed to be in Rui's hand, and so finding the name given on this, uh, to the schooner on this side of the sheet also supports the notion that this is the second draft. This detail also shows some liquid spills or drip marks, just here. We can speculate that Rui sloshed a bit of his tea or coffee and set the cup down on the sheet a few times as he was working. The right hand image shows another detail that we couldn't see very well in the overall image of the first draft side of the sheet. It's probably a fingerprint just here uh, and one of two or three such marks on that side of the sheet. So in having viewed these images, you'll perhaps get a sense of the challenge I faced when I went to develop a conservation treatment plan for these drawings to propose to Jeff in his role as the curator for the Rui collection. A very first common step in the treatment of drawings on paper is to surface clean the non-image bearing areas. What we term surface grime can be composed of all sorts of molecules or compounds that are transferred from people's hands or from the air. Just think of what's, uh, what's in cigarette smoke to the paper. These can react with the embodied moisture and the structure of the cellulose that makes up the paper to alter the pH and catalyze reactions that can weaken or make the paper more brittle, not to mention obscure or impede the reading and appreciation of a drawing. So it's common practice to remove as much of this grime as possible. But in the case of the drawings on either side of this piece of paper, how could we discern what's a properly surface grime versus an intentional mark, a smudge, or evidence of an erasure that tells us something about the creation and use of the drawing? Well, very fortunately, heritage institutions in Canada have access to an agency within the Department of Canadian Heritage called the Canadian Conservation Institute, or CCI. The CCI employs specialized research conservators, scientists, and technologists who facilitate access to a host of analytical tools. So to inform the conservation treatment proposal that I would draft, I contacted colleagues at the CCI to ask, to ask for assistance in better examining and documenting the first and second draft Blue Nose drawings. Here's an image from a series by CCI scientific documentation technologist, Jermaine Wiseman. It's of the second draft side of, this, of the drawing and taken in infrared. As you likely know, graphite is a form of carbon, which is highly absorbent at the infrared end of the light spectrum. As a result, all of the graphite markings appear darker when captured in this image versus how they appear to us in normal light. Now we can much more clearly see things like the calculations in the margins, annotations within the boundaries of the sails, and where lines were erased or their angles changed slightly. The images taken by the CCI helped us to see and to better document not only the features of the drawing before treatment, but also some of the characteristics of the paper, which is what I want to talk about next. In the credits for the drawings at the right of the screen, you'll see that I've written, this is a piece of handmade wove paper with its maximum length and width. It's an imperial sheet, which like, Fool's cap or demi or elephant is the name for paper of a particular sheet size. It's not in this case about inches being imperial units of measurement. So how do I know these things about the sheet of paper? Let's start with the edges. This sheet wasn't cut from a larger roll of paper made on a machine. Instead, it has four natural decal edges, meaning it was made by hand using a paper mold. Here, images taken in transmitted normal light and transmitted infrared 
help illustrate the characteristics of a handmade sheet. Both show us the presence of a watermark that reads J. Watman, 1911 England, and B along the bottom of the sheet. And those characters read correctly when one is viewing the sheet from the first draft side. This is significant. For those of us charged with the care and documentation of the Rui collection, his use of this particular sheet of paper stands out. Of the nearly 800 plans in the collection, only a handful are original drawings executed on paper, and none of those besides this one is a purpose-made drawing paper of this quality. Let's talk a little more about this watermark. Most people today will only recognize the Wattman name and its association with paper if they work in a scientific field. Wattman filter papers used for qualitative extraction processes have been made under that name for about 100 years. But the Wattman name became synonymous with fine paper beginning when James Wattman the Elder in Maidstone, Kent, England, was credited with the invention of wove paper in the 1750s. The relatively smooth, uninterrupted surface of wove, as compared to earlier laid paper, allowed for innovations in printing, think John Baskerville, and drafting in watercolor, think J.M.W. Turner, that cemented the association between the Wattman name and the highest quality papers in the minds of the public for, armo for almost 200 years. But Wattman paper was only made by a company owned by people named Wattman for about 50 of those years before the rights to the name were sold to two related but competing concerns. One of those was the W&R Ballston Company, thus the B countermark at the proper bottom left of the sheet. Makers of Wattman paper watermarked at the edges of their sheets. This ensured that a watermark did not detract from the legibility of a drawing and that the mark itself remained legible. The physical features of the sheet discussed thus far are all clues that this early 20th century sheet of J. Wattman drawing paper was handmade and of high quality and was therefore relatively expensive to buy. The price for Wattman drawing paper had been built on quality and reputation to the extent that the J. Wattman watermark was fre frequently forged by competing paper mills, even those outside England. Though we have it on good authority, namely Mr. Stephen Hill of the British and International Associations of Paper Historians, that this sheet has all the characteristics of the genuine article. The quality of the paper was in one way ensured by the training of its makers, who had to serve an apprenticeship of seven years. This slide shows a scan of an apprenticeship agreement signed in 1908 with the text of the agreement transcribed on the right. The apprentice papermaker, Sidney John Farr, began work at Ballston Springfield Mill, too late to have been the vatman, kutcher, or layer who made our sheet of paper in the year, if you remember the watermark, 1911. But the sheet on which William Rui drew his plans for Blue Nose could have been made by a crew that included Vatman William Quinton, seen here making J. Wattman imperial paper in the number 10 vat house at Ballston Springfield Mill. Now, I should caution that dating a piece of paper using just a watermark isn't a wholly dependable practice, but our expert consultant confirmed that the dates on the paper molds used at Springfield were changed out every year, meaning that Rui's sheet was most likely made in 1911 and therefore aged a little less than 10 years before he drew the design for Blue Nose on it in the fall of 1920. The skill of Vatman, such as William Quinton or Sidney Farr, if he served his apprenticeship well, had to be such that he could ensure consistent paper thickness both throughout each sheet that he formed and amongst all sheets of the same type. This was so that his output could be sold at the highest price in a ream of good insides rather than, than as broken paper in a ream of what was called retreat. In this image, I'm measuring the thickness of one of several points along the edges of a sheet in order to record that detail in my report. Now, Jeff and I were recently interested to learn from Adrian Morrison, curator at the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic in Lunenburg, that they've acquired William Rui's original handwritten invoice for designing Blue Nose, as well as the list of expenses he submitted to the Blue Nose Schooner Company. 
And Adrian has looked, but unfortunately, the materials used to draft the design, like this, like our Watton paper, aren't itemized. So at this point, we don't know exactly what Rui paid for it. However, using a 1912 price list supplied by Stephen Hill, we see the wholesale price charged for Rui Sheet and its sisters when sold by the Ballston Mill in England. As presented in the slide, a ream of insides, or 400 and 480 good sheets of 72 pound imperial size handmade J. Wattman drawing paper was priced at 120 pounds, nine shillings in 1912. Rounded and adjusted for inflation, that sum is over 14,000 British pounds or almost $24,000 Canadian today. That's approximately 40 Canadian dollars per sheet. Pre-1914, common sources indicate that the pound sterling was equal to 4.87 Canadian dollars, but perhaps Rui purchased his sheet after the war. In the post-war period in which Rui designed Blue Nose, one of the primary Canadian distributors of J. Wattman paper, the Hugh Hughes Owens Company Limited, was none too pleased at a proposed change in their business arrangements with W&R Ballston in England. Pictured here is a letter dated November 1923 from the president of the Hughes Owens Company to Charles H. Ballston Esquire. It states their position this way, quote, Canada before the war was meek and humble, but after the sacrifices she made, she woke up to the fact that she was really somebody. And today, when the English manufacturer offhand tells the Canadian merchant that he must go to the great United States and buy through them, not only is his pride hurt, but he is seriously irritated. Most merchants in Canada would prefer to, to give their orders to Germany rather than to the United States. While we are being overshadowed by them, by their literature and the number of them amongst us, we are in no wise Americanized, end quote. Strong sentiments, but beyond price, what we also have here is mention of influence, the influence of American culture, and despite the letter writer's pronouncement, its impact in Canada. Let's step back a moment and remind ourselves that what we're driving at here is the meaning and significance of Rui's use of this piece of paper for his initial design drawings for Blue Nose. Remember that his selection and use of this paper were decisions made in the fall of 1920, a year before the first successes of Blue Nose. Her legendary success may have been a reason for Rui to keep these drawings. First drafts such as these don't often survive, but does not explain the initial material choice. We've already discussed the relatively high cost of this paper compared with all of the other drawing supports used by Rui and represented in the collection. Another question arises when one considers the suitability of this paper to the intended task. As described in the drafting materials catalogs of the Canadian distributor Hughes Owens and other prominent companies like K&E, who had offices in Montreal, an example of their catalog is here at Wright, um, from whom we know Rui source drafting tools, this particular paper has a somewhat grainy surface texture meant for watercolor and, uh, and general use that's not best suited for finely drawn graphite, li graphite lines like we see in these first drafts. Now, perhaps Rui intended to work up a presentation drawing in ink and watercolor for which this paper would have been suited, but that intention was maybe scrapped by the necessity of the redesign. So again, I wonder, what could have influenced his decision to use a piece of Wattman drawing paper? And why do I think his material choice for this drawing is significant? Jeff has already explained that Rui was mostly self-taught and at the time of, of his commission to design Blue Nose was not yet a full-time professional naval architect. But as Jeff also explained, he did know a formerly trained architect, Raymond Lessel, and moved in circles where we assume he had uh, an interest in and would have been exposed to the relevant trade literature. It was fairly common for such journals and magazines to include articles about industrial, domestic, and naval architecture in a single issue. One example of this is Pencil Points Magazine, which was first published in June 1920 and after 1945 became the prominent magazine Progressive Architecture. One point that is made repeatedly in articles in this publication, and here I've pasted an example from 1924, is that, quote, 
Architecture as a profession should rank in the minds of the public as on par, at least, with law and medicine. The author then continues, we cannot maintain it so by teaching craft alone. Architects must have knowledge of building processes as well as of good design. Now, we can certainly debate the point of view that led to the denigration of craft skills in favor of academic study. But the point here was that the American trade literature of the period was highly concerned with the elevation of the field and that to style oneself an architect, one had to be able to conceive of and communicate one's design through finished drawings. Now, within the same pages of the American trade literature, wherein these ideas were circulating, were advertisements placed by the US distributor of Wattman paper, Harry Reeve Angel and Company. That's the same company that Canadian distributor Hughes Owens would become upset at being told to deal with through WNR Ballston. Here's an ad for Wattman drawing paper placed in pencil points by Harry Reeve Angel that reads at the bottom, look for the watermark. It denotes the genuine Wattman. The point being made in parallel with the articles about the elevation and maintenance of the field was not just the use of reputable materials for the presumed better working properties, uh, but the importance of their use as a marker of one's professional status. So in having studied some of the history of drafting materials and their use, knowing that those with aspirations towards architecture deliberately chose high quality materials for their drawings in order to prove their professionalism, and recognizing the significance of Wattman paper, that it was believed by some that the only papers of quality were those bearing the name Wattman. When I first saw William Ruiz drawings for Blue Nose at the home of the donor in Dartmouth, and then a bit later in studying a broader collection with Jeff as the curator and with our archivists at the Museum of History, the first and second draft drawings stood out for me as unique within the collection, not only for their content, but for their materiality. The significance that I read into Ruiz's use of a piece of J. Wattman drawing paper is that even as he set down his initial idea for the schooner he'd been commissioned to design in 1920. His choice of material was influenced by the potential that this design had to change the course of his career, to style and establish himself as a professional naval architect. And sure enough, that's what he did. So, Having discussed the significance of the drawings and all that Jeff and I were considering, I'll now present a quick overview of the conservation treatment of the original drawings for Blue Nose. Earlier in the presentation, we saw images of the drawings after initial humidification and flattening, but before any subsequent steps had been performed. In the end, we decided to surface clean only the first draft side of the sheet. These images show the dry surface cleaning of the margins around the drawing in progress using soft brushes and white polyvinyl eraser crumbs. Here the work continues inside the area of the sails with the addition of an electric razor, pardon me, eraser, used with uh, various erasing, erasing shields to get very close to the graphite lines without risking their damage. Here we have a little more progress on the first draft side with a close-up view on the right. I should mention that all of these working images were taken under fluorescent light. And now here we have the before and after treatment images of the second draft side where no surface cleaning took place. And here we have the first draft side again with the surface cleaning and other treatment steps completed. Now, before ending, I'd like to acknowledge one more time that this exploration of Wattman paper was made possible in large part due to the generosity of paper historian Stephen R. Hill, who in addition to providing information and some of the images used in this presentation, also sent us from England, a sister sheet of J. Wattman 1911 Imperial handmade drawing paper from his own collection. Here it's seen to the right, placed beside the blue nose drawing. That sister sheet will be added to the museum's collection to help us tell the story of the significance of this paper. Last but not least, we'd like to acknowledge all those who made our work on the W.J. Rui collection, the virtual exhibition, and this presentation possible. 
and invite you, our audience, once again, to visit the exhibition, where you can see more about Rui and his designs, the collection, and its care and conservation treatment. Thank you.